Welcome back to another episode of Be Our Guest here on Musical Theater Radio. I am your host, as always, Jean-Paul Yovanoff. Today, we're doing something a little bit different. You all know I talk about stage musicals on this podcast, but this is the first film we're going to be talking about. No, not a musical turned into a movie, but a legit movie musical. Or is it a movie with music? I guess we're going to find out when we talk. Uh, the film Killing and the Comeback Kids is about a young mixed race musician who is forced to return to a struggling rural hometown after an expensive college degree. An accidental encounter with a childhood acquaintance provides the summer new direction and a chance to unite a divided community. Let's welcome the star, director, and creator of Killian and the Comeback Kids, Taylor A. Purdy. Taylor, hello. Hey, hey, yeah, uh, those are all really good starting questions. So, um, <laughs> well, I didn't mean to take your thunder and and and, and give away the entire um, no, plot. No. I read that IMDb, so it worked out. I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's an as you know a relatively accurate description bouncing around the internet. Yeah, that's, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. Now, before we get into the movie, um, I want to get to know you a little bit. So, um, in 30 seconds, can we get the 30 second bio of Taylor? Um, my mom's a documentarian. My father is a soap star. Those things couldn't be more different. She makes social action movies. Um, my background's in theater. I was at theater school. Um, but I like movies. Cinema was kind of always the, the go-to and, uh, the two things, uh, there's this musical. And then the next one that's coming out is a documentary about the murder capital of the world. So I guess, <laughs> yeah, I'm still... I'm walking all those lines. <laughs> There's a combo <laughs> going from a musical to uh, the murder capital. That, that's interesting. Um, so obviously with your dad in the, the industry, were you, you were always um, into theater growing up or is that something you discovered a little bit later? No, it definitely came later. I had, I had a being a scientist phase, definitely a, a wanting to be an Egyptologist phase. <laughs> nice. um, but yeah, I, I, I came to it later. I mean, I guess I had like a theater kid middle school phase um, that led me to going to a performing arts high school. Um, but I was definitely, because so many of the artists that were adults that I knew when I was growing up kind of moved through film and theater. And it was kind of a surprise for me when I realized like halfway through theater school that, oh, like a lot of these kids, they, they're going to make theater and that they're not going to do television. They're not going to make films. Um, but for me, it's always been a real like holistic mix of things, which um, wasn't as uh, normal as I expected it to be, but is very natural for me and the friends that I've since, you know, made along the way. And probably why this one's such an amalgam. Nice. Now the question is, why Egyptology? Why <laughs> that? You know what? I have tried so hard to remember what set it off. I'm usually really good at that, but <laughs> I, I know that it was around the time that the Mummy franchise came out, but I know it was before that because I remember feeling like, oh, the world is interested in what I'm interested in. There's a blockbuster about it. And I remember that there was a period where instead of a bedtime story, I had my grandmother read me Howard Carter's journal. He's the guy who discovered <laughs> um, But I do not know what set it off. It's one of those, one of the few like seminal memories I can't track down. Huh, interesting. Because <laughs> I'm always curious about people that when they go into the arts, if there is something else that, you know, percolating in the back of their head that they might've done if, if we got another timeline or another universe. For me, it was either Egyptology or I definitely have a recurring fantasy about being a professor of, of myths in a small town in the south of France. Uh, There's still time. Right? No, <laughs> totally. Do you speak French? Not at all. <laughs> you have a hard time <laughs> making this come true. My girlfriend speaks five languages, so the, that, that, that helps. That does help very much. <laughs> very cool. So um, did you go to school for, for film or theater, or what did you go to once you? Um, so I, uh, I kind of did like eight years of theater school. There was right around the time that I was going to high school, this performing arts school popped up in the, the like weird little Pennsylvania town I was, I was living in. Um, it was like three years deep. So I went there for theater. Um, and then I went to Fordham in Manhattan to like for another theater degree. Um, but that was kind of the same experience of, I was looking at it as a very like holistic, like storytelling milieu thing. But a lot of my friends were like, no, we, this is the stage. Peter Brooks says a man walks across the fourth wall and blah, blah, blah. But some of the only advice I ever got was um, if you're to study theater rather than film, because film schools, especially that one, were largely technical and theater education was more about both like the working and the collaboration and the like the how do you tell a story mm -hmm. and um, go to school in New York was other good advice I got. If I was going to study one of those things, go be in New York so that between classes you could 
be part of the scene in the world. I think that definitely helped. Nice. So let's let's talk about the movie. Tell us a little bit outside of what I already said about the movie. Um, what was it about? Yeah. So I mean, you're right. It's it's kind of neither of a traditional musical or a music a movie with music. I mean, there there is no dancing, but there's a ton of songs. It, it essentially it follows a guy who's uh, graduated from college, an expensive college, supposed to go off on um like a legit but modest musical tour with his bandmate, and he stops back home to see his folks after graduation. Um, and they're like kind of rural struggling town and his bandmate drops out his bandmate gets a better job and he leaves the tour so our, our guy kind of gets stuck in this uh this town where the uh, the major industry the steel mill has pulled out and so he kind of has to get reacquainted with all of the people that maybe he like left to go to the big city and wasn't really into when he like and the only thing the town has going for it is this big music festival kind of on the outskirts um that normally is just like a giant thing and you know it brings in money for the vendors but whatever um, but this year there's, you know, there's a slot for a local act, um, but then it doesn't go quite the way you would think. Uh, there's, there's a lot of um, like Mickey and Judy putting on a show in the barn vibes in it. But I was, um, I was, I was really into Once and that, that director, John Carney's film. So Once, Sing Street, and this sort of um, like, it's not a musical, it's about people that are a band. And so that's why it's full of music and also so, so that's why I say it's not, there's no dancing, but it's full of music. It follows this band. It follows them creating these songs. And so that's where this, the music comes from. But I was really interested in kind of like an, an ode to amateurism kind of a thing. The idea that it's really hard to start a band, especially from scratch. And so tracking when the characters, especially my character, like maybe aren't great at music. And um, uh, was, was a, a big thing for us, trying to find the moments where we could be off key, but acceptable so that eventually it can be a big musical in the end. So what was the impetus? What was the, the thing that, the aha moment for creating this movie? Um, it's a great question. Um, I, was, I was trying to write something that I knew I had the resources for. I couldn't do Star Wars 12. Everybody wants to write Star Wars 12. Yeah. Um, and I knew that I, you know, I had like the Pennsylvania countryside. I had a couple actors that I was gonna write for myself, my dad, a friend of mine who'd been at theater school with me. Um, but the thing that was kind of the reason it's a musical is twisty because I'd made this documentary beforehand that is coming out afterhand. Um, and I'd done a lot of things on that myself, but the one thing I hadn't done was do any music for it. And we had a great composer and he got some orchestral stuff and that was great, but it seemed like, I don't know if we're gonna be able to afford that or I, I don't know how that works, but I was getting really into um, like singer songwriter folk rock stuff at the time. And I was like, well, I know that at, at the, the Concurrently with writing the script, I was, was like kind of around the holidays. So I was hanging out with a friend who had like made a little recording studio like in his bedroom at his parents' house. Um, and I was like, well, I mean, if we could do that, then we could probably write a couple like banjo underscore things to get the movie going. And if, I mean, if there's the banjo is the underscore, then maybe if they sing the songs that in that style, that explains why it sounds like that. And if they're singing the songs, then you don't need to have like complex emotional like uh, subtext. There can be that in the real scenes. And then some delightful breaking out into song when you can't have a lightsaber fight. Um, and so in some ways it's a musical because I was trying to make it easier on myself. And of course that's not what happened. It made it way more difficult. But the real twist for me is that I'd been dreading doing the score. And in the end, it ended up being my, my favorite part because the, the actual underscore, not just the songs, because it's that combination of creativity like the writing of it and then like the technical production of it um, without any of the like houses of like actually being on the set. So I was trying to make it a musical to make it easier. It made it harder, but in a really fun way. But hey, you know what? As long as you're having a good time doing it too, that's sometimes- <laughs> yeah, Free time, no doubt. Uh, so when did when did the this idea come into fruition and, and what was the process moving towards this end product? Well, we got to make it really quickly. I think we were filming like, maybe eight months after I wrote it, which is not the norm, but it meant that there was a much longer like back end timeline. Normally you develop a film, then you have the money and then you go for it. We like, we're still finding executive producers halfway through filming it. And so that, that slowed down some of the production. But then the, the real issue was that it was supposed to come out, it was uh, either the end of 2019 or like the fall, the like spring of 2020, but then the world collapsed. <laughs> Yep. Um, and so that's a whole giant thing, but it ended up coming out in theaters in like sep in September of 2020. It was one of the first things back in theaters. 
um, which was super cool and weird. And everybody thought, oh, the world's gonna slowly get back to normal and we'll add theaters. And then of course that didn't happen. Yeah. And then they kind of froze the movie so that waiting until New York because of its theater people and LA because of its movie people reopened. And so then it kind of came out again in like September of 2021. And it's had this really strange like COVID era life. It's got all these weird like COVID asterisks and records that it broke because like nothing was happening. Um, but now it's finally on the internet and everywhere all this time later. It's, I think we've had like three different, the movies out nowadays, it's, you know, one every year. It's been, you know, weird. It's like three premieres. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah definitely. So, wow. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about uh, who's in the show. Um, so it's, it's a really kind of cool mix of like New York street musicians, like TV stars that you've, you know, lived with forever and some, and some Broadway people. Um, so I know that uh, you deal a lot of musical stuff. So the, the kind of female lead is played by Shannon O'Boyle, who was in Kinky Boots and Once, and she's just fantastic. Um, and then one of the other major female characters is played by a girl named Emily Mest, who most people at this point know from her like Ryan Murphy, like horror show stuff. She pops up in Ratchet and um, an American Horror Story, but she'd done one of the early tours of Spring Awakening. Um, and I think she, and the American Girl musical, when like mm. that was, I remember, because she and I had gone to high school together. And I remember it was like a thing when Emily like had done the American Girl musical. And so when I was putting this together, I really kind of wanted that blend of people that were trained that way, because even though I wanted to make a, a, a movie, my background is in the theater. And so even in like having the auditions process, uh, I look back and I'm like, wow, we did that. Like we were casting a play. There was, there was, you know, you come in and there's the callbacks and then like, oh, you'll wait around and you re repair the people together. Um, and then my parents are played by my actual dad, Nathan Purdy, who uh, had a huge career on daytime. And then the woman playing my mother uh, is Cassie DePaiva, who a lot of people know from the Evil Dead movies. Um, but also she had been, she's also a huge soap star. And so she and my dad had done um, like 10 years of One Life to Live, which is a new, was a New York based soap together, but they never had any, really any stuff together. He was like the upstanding African-American attorney and she like was dating the murderer guy. Um, and so they never got to have any stuff to play, but they'd become, they'd been great friends. And so it was a real treat to get to write them something where they could interact as actors with like some real stuff going on, as opposed to like, sometimes the soaps can be racially divided mm -hmm. in a questionable way. Yeah. Um, and so it was a real treat to stick them together. Um, there's a surprise uh, voiceover cameo by Academy Award winner Lee Grant, which, you know, she's, she's just, you know, fabulous. And if you're a theater person or a movie person, it doesn't matter. I'm sure you have some favorite Lee Grant thing. <laughs> um, and then like one of the guys from Blue Men, the Blue Man group comes in. Uh, there's, there's a YouTube star. We kind of like drew from every like angle because, because the, um, the band in the film is that they're kind of, you know, thrown together, found family stuff. And so I wanted people from all those kind of different backgrounds, like, you know, all these different versions of music, but music that never, you know, mixes together. And I will say about the Broadway people I had, when we were casting, I had a bit of an edict that was anybody who wanted to come read who'd done any version of Once, the, the stage play, was welcome. But <laughs> oh my God, there have been so many productions of that at this point. And yeah. it was and fabulous. And I was glad to get to, because uh, I, I, we'd had to do like chemistry reads with, me at some point I'd be like okay forget that I'm directing it, but now we're gonna sing together yeah. and it was a real uh, treat and uh, scary to try to do that with all of those talented talented musicians <laughs> um but yeah yeah it's full of uh, kind of all walks of musical life and I'd, I'd spent a lot of time before and just kind of as a hobby playing uh, like busking uh, like in, either in Central Park or underneath the in the subway right underneath Times Square okay um and so you know, my street music and Shannon O'Boyle's Broadway fabulosity, you know, all the blend. <laughs> nice. So what was it like to uh, have to direct your dad? Is it always fun? <laughs> it is fun. I mean, uh, we'd, we'd done little things like that before and we kind of built up to it, but I always kind of say that it's like, um, it's like playing pretend in the backyard rules. Like Darth Vader's always going to let Luke win in the end. And, and, you know, he'll say that it took him a minute to like get used to like, me being in charge, but I'd slowly over the years had him like come in and do little things with me, knowing that one day I was gonna need him to really listen and hit his mark. <laughs> but the other thing I'd say is that when he and uh, Cassie who plays my mother in it, 
the, the days with them were definitely a treat because like everyone else were like, this was the, the first film role for a lot of people. And it like, you know, they're a young band. And, and every time one of the parents came on set, it was like, oh damn, now, now we're making some art. We, we knew that like we would get to do acting on those days, you know? Um, and especially because they're so people, the like, you know, nothing can phase them. They've done this every day for 30 years kind of a thing. Nice. Now you said you have a theater background. Um, how is this your first film? And if so, what was it like moving from theater acting to film acting? Did you find that difficult, easy? Um, no, I I didn't find it difficult because I'd been kind of thinking that way for so long. And I think because I'd got I'd been lucky enough to like start acting young and like have a big theat like theatery education. That, that sense of like which is which started to come pretty naturally and you know I'd been auditioning for years mm -hmm. um so no it, it was it wasn't all that strange of a change but I think there's also the upside of this being a musical so there's always that like even for a film yeah it's not you know musical acting but there are such big emotional moments you know and so th th that definitely came naturally so you've got an album. What was that? But how did you record that? Was did you go into the studio? Did you have to do it during COVID times? Um, yeah. So we definitely broke all of the musical rules on that. <laughs> when you make a, a music musical movie, you're supposed to record all the songs beforehand and then go and act them to the playback. Which, like, uh, I guess I knew that was a thing. And at one point, we thought, well, you know, we'll do the acting scenes the first week, and then afterwards, we'll go back to New York and we'll record all the songs. And then, because, like I said, it all came together so quickly. Mm -hmm. And at one point we had to build the schedule around, um, so Shannon from Kinky Boots came into audition between the matinee and evening shows of Kinky Boots. She, that's when her audition was. And then we had to build wow. the schedule in a way that she could like leave the show Saturday, miss the Sunday mat matinee, be back in time for the Tuesday performance. And like, so there was such a, this has to happen right now, miss that was going on that we ended up kind of recording all the music live um, and then using those as scratch tracks to go back into the studio and build the version that's actually in the film. Mm -hmm. And that pr pr you know, provided some technical uh, nuisances occasionally, but it also, I think, and I didn't plan this, this is just the way it happened. Because we were recording the, like, so for instance, the first song that everybody sings together as a band was also the first day the whole band was together. So we were managed to capture the actual, like, how does it go, here we go, excitement of it. That I think if we had done the studio version, we might have lost that. And so would I do it this way every time? Ah, but for this one, it like luckily totally fit the world of, of the play. So essentially what you're hearing, we, we recorded it and then kept like those choices and those tempos and that. And I, and I essentially, I, I edited it to the, the live versions. And then we went back in and recorded to what we knew we, we already had edited down. That's great. Because yeah, that honest authenticity of the moment is sometimes lost when you, you've done this and you've already yeah. less than fantastic even though harder obviously and something that always bugs me in, in music films is when like you know they're walking down the street their cars honking and then suddenly it all goes away and he's bradley cooper and he's perfect and we really wanted one like i said earlier the the watching them become a band and finding the moments where like ah they're not super great but also allowing the because a lot of it takes place they're like you know they're on somebody's back porch record like rehearsing and making sure in the mix that we had all of the crickets and the birds and the and so having the actual recordings of this is what it sounded like at that place helped and it also allowed us to build into sort of the musical magic logic of the first song we sing is like me alone in the town square not being great and then by the end it's the giant show and being able to go from, you know, where, what's the car and the fountain sound in the bad version through like, oh, are there crickets or the birds into like, no, boom, concert, here we go. Everything's technicolor. Um, yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. Those little things that you don't necessarily think of, but they make such a difference. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's awesome. So with your theater background, have you thought about putting it on stage at some point? Is there a thought of that in the future? So at first it started as, as a joke. My, uh, my childhood best friend wrote the music with me and he's not a theater person at all. So at first I, I would tease and be like, you know, one day we got to do the Broadway version then, you know, and have them have cats-esque nightmares. <laughs> then 
we were like, wait, but like actually, actually though, so after it came out last year, the second round of theaters, I, I did sit down and kind of storyboard a theater version of it. So it's increasingly a thing that we're thinking about because I, I, that would be fun. And, and it's not, there, there is like a subtextual, like kind of like race plot line that is, I was trying to not focus on it and that was kind of the point. Mm -hmm. But the more I, I work on it, the more I'm like, you know what, actually, I feel like I haven't seen a thing like this on the stage in a while. And I would love to do that. So yeah, we're, we're, there, there, there are some detailed notes that exist in my computer. <laughs> Nice. Okay. Well, I'll be watching for that then at some point in the future. If, if it happens, I'll, I'll know about it. Awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you definitely know about it. <laughs> so how do people, you know, listen to the soundtrack? Where can they see the movie? Yeah. Well, like I said, you know, it's been, if we'd done this at any point time in the past years, I'd be like, ah, oh, you know, check your Fandango. Maybe you have a theater that's open. Ah. Yeah. Uh, but now uh, it's everywhere. I mean, you can Google it, but essentially if you look at Killing and the Comeback Kids, I'm sure you'll be able to post a link. Um, it's on all, all of the VOD places, wherever you buy movies, Amazon, Vudu, that kind of stuff. Um, there are some places that have like the special editions that not everywhere has. And that's cool because there's, there's like the commentary, deleted scenes. There's a, an, uh, like a, a conversation that I did with Peter Yarrow at one point when it was doing its award season. Mm -hmm. So that's cool just because like that guy's a living legend. Um, and the, the soundtrack is all over its stream and it's on iTunes. Um, I think we're, we're looking at releasing a, um, an instrumental version and then maybe uh, some, like a deluxe version that has some of the songs that aren't on the main soundtrack. But the main soundtrack is out. It's all the places you could want to find it. Very cool. Well, congratulations on, on putting it together. And, and it sounds like a fantastic movie that uh, everyone should be taking a listen to. I listened to the soundtrack yesterday. Congrats. Sounds great. Um, yeah. So thank you for coming on and telling us a little bit about the movie. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to get to talk to a musical audience because <laughs> I definitely was thinking about them for a lot of this. You know, I had to explain a lot of musical tropes to the movie people like nah man like trust me they're gonna they, they're gonna understand for sure well before we go i always ask three questions of my guests now there's no right or wrong answer but we're gonna get to know you a little bit better and then the audience is very judgy so we'll, we'll see what they think of your answers um but okay so question number one nice easy one is is there a creator or team within musical theater that's had a good influence on you you know it could be a composer lyricist director producer actor even stage manager it could be somebody famous or not famous anybody in theater or musical theater that's had a great influence on you uh okay yeah um not original i'm a big sondheim kid definitely a big sondheim kid but i there's also i don't know off Broadway, for, it ran for like 15 years. There was the sh there was a show Fuerza Bruta, okay. which played in the Daryl Roth Theater. Um, I loved it as a kid. Uh, I got to work on it at one point, but it's kind of Cirque meets a nightclub meets like experimental theater, oh. and the sort of genre bending, um, emotional musical extravaganza of of that uh, has stuck with me since I was like 16, um, and saw it for the first time, and so. When I think about the theater that I'm interested in, it's always a combination of Sondheim and Argentinian Cirque. <laughs> That's a combo I want to see now. Right though, right though. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe they do the new Into the Woods and do it that way. Into the Woods would work totally well as that. Yeah, that would. Hmm. I would still see that. Okay, we'll think about that for the future. We'll save that for now. Put a pin in it. Awesome. Correct answer. Can't go wrong with Sondheim. So first answer correct. Second answer, second, sorry, second question. Is there a future Mummy the Musical in the works from you? Oh my God, I would love that. Are you kidding? Brendan Fraser's making a comeback right now? Yeah, exactly. No questions. I don't know if he can sing, but you know what? Let's, let's see if we can do this. <laughs> you know, there, there's, a, there's a moment in Killian where somebody gives a bad audition and I say, hey, like I'm trying to like let him down and I say, thanks for the rock. And ever since we did that, my friends and I had this joke, like we need that gif and we need to send it to whoever the casting director for The Mummy Returns was, because they gave us Dwayne Johnson The Rock. <laughs> You're actually from the town that we filmed this in. So actually this is all coming together right now. Yeah. It's a circle of life. <laughs> so another correct answer, because I would love to see The Mummy musical uh, at some point. Don't know how it's going to work, but still want to see it. All right, third question. 
Food in the theater or cell phones in the theater, which is worse, either live theater or film theater. Wow, man. Who? I want to say cell phones because part of me like likes the like democratization of food in the theater, but also I will say, I uh, my my dad at one point uh, had like a getting back to the, his theater roots phase. And he was doing, um, he was working at the Billy Holiday in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever been to this theater. It's like a historic black theater, but it's across the street from a crown fried chicken. And at intermission, people will go across, get the fried chicken and bring it back and eat it like popcorn at the movies. Um, and it was very strange for me as like a mm -hmm. young theater artist who only knew like, you know, mainstream white Broadway. Um, but yeah, I think, I think cell phones are more annoying. <laughs> I, I saw a production of something where I think it was Sam Jackson like stopped the play and told somebody to like turn off their phone. Sam Jackson does that. You you, you listen. You better do it. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I I you know what? Either works for me. No. Uh, they're both terrible in, in my opinion. Okay. Well, are you a fan of food in a film theater? Yes, probably. But cell phones. There's no. Yeah, no, no. I mean, cell phones are definitely annoying. I took yeah. I it was my mom's birthday this weekend. And she was a big fan of the of the book where the crawdads sing. So we took her to see the movie, mm -hmm. and there was somebody like twelve rows in front of her with a cell phone, and she just started like like little demure woman. She started like like she had asked him three times, and each time she got louder and louder and louder until she's yelling across <laughs> the theater like, "Come here to watch the cinema. Turn on your phone." Um, I, I think we have to get Sam Jackson to record his thing so we can play it anytime and just put it in people's face there. <laughs> definitely <laughs> <laughs> all right uh another correct answer <laughs> three for three congratulations i got no prizes but you can brag to everybody <laughs> you want to um uh, taylor again thank you so much for coming on congratulations on the movie thank you i i, I have an i have an anecdote that I, or not an anecdote i have a fact that i want musical people musical people to know sure. this is gonna, like we're gonna get to this one day okay um so, like I said, I'm a huge fan of Once, the musical, the movie version. That movie got, it was a little movie, obviously, it got big when it won the Oscar, that song was great, we love that. But growing up with that mythology, I got really into, that's my favorite Oscar category, the best original song. It turns out that there is a category that those people have on the books that has never been used before, that is best original musical. Um, really? But the reason they nev they've never turned it on before is they have a really complex series of rules that allow them to not have to use it. Essentially, you have to have at least five songs that are done on screen that are from the same composing team. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times Pixar will have, you know, 12 dudes per song, different 12 dudes. Yeah. And you ha they have to have like a full slate, depending on the year, it's either five or 10 films that the Academy deems like well produced enough to, to activate this. So not only do you need you know, to fit the five song, five dudes category. Also, you need like 10 other people to have produced a mo movie musical in the same year. But the last couple of years, cause like we've come close and I believe that one day enough of us are gonna make musical cinema that they will at least have to, you know, nominate lin -Manuel Miranda for this, you know? And we'll all <laughs> we'll have gotten in there together. All right, so listeners out there, if you have made a movie musical, I think you gotta figure out all of you and get together. Um, you may lose to the mummy musical, but I'm okay with that too. Yeah. So, but, um, thank you again for coming on Taylor. And it was great meeting you and learning about the show. Yeah. I'm really glad to be here. I'm glad to be talking to musical people. Thank All you. right. No problem. We were just speaking with Taylor A. Purdy, the creator, writer, director of Killian and the Comeback Kids. Tune in next week as we'll be speaking with another guest or guests about their life, love, and passion that is musical theater. I am your host as always, Jean-Paul Yovanoff. And until next time, I'll see you when I see you.